Thank you, Father, for this time that you've given us to uh, come together and have fellowship one with another and explore your word and to see all of the really marvelous things that you've left there for us to discover and to use in our spiritual lives. <clears throat> Help us through this class, Father, that your, your spirit might open um, our hearts to the things that you have to show us. Uh, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. All right, we left off chapter five. Now we're going to start chapter six. <clears throat> um, and I'll begin with chapter six and verse one. Now I watched <clears throat> when the lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. <clears throat> when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. <clears throat> and out came another horse, bright red. This rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse and his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And his rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers could be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as, fig tree, as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that had been rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For well, the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? <clears throat> Chapter 6 introduces God's judgment on earth and its inhabitants. Some of the judgments are natural in the sense that they're natural events <clears throat> like earthquakes, volcanoes. Uh, but we must keep in mind that God is in control of these events. Thus, we must except that anything that happens during the tribulation, God is either a direct cause or allows it under the principle of his permissive will and using mankind to execute his will. Therefore, the argument that the wrathful part of the tribulation does not begin until the midpoint is totally without merit. The rest of chapter 6 through 19 of the book can be summarized thusly. There are three series of judgments, the seals, which we just read, trumpets, and bowls, and they come in chronological order. Seals first, then during the seventh seal, we have the trumpet judgments. Then during the seventh trumpet, 
we have the bowl judgments. They should be viewed as increasing in, in, in intensity at a compound rate. At the end of the tribulation, you'll have the bowl judgment poured out on top of the seventh trumpet judgment, which itself is on top of the seventh seal judgment. That's a lot of judgments. Some of these take place during the first half of the tribulation, which are mostly divine natural judgments, followed by intense war during the second half. The sealed judgments are revealed here in chapter 6. The trumpet judgments are revealed in chapters 8 and 9, and the bold judgments are revealed in chapter 16. The other chapters, chapter 7, chapters 11 through 15, and 17 through 19, should be seen as parenthetical in the sense that they give additional information about what's going on. <clears throat> These parenthetical chapters are not necessarily in chronological order. They either cover the entire period or spotlight, spotlight an event within a period, or they survey the first or the last half of the period. The story can be followed by focusing on the three sets of judgments and what is between is supplemental inf information put there for clarification. I gave you a chart here. The various views of the timing of these three groups of judgments, seals, trumpets, and bowls, can be distilled down to mainly three uh, as illustrated above. <clears throat> Almost all agree that the next series of judgment begins and is contained within the last or seventh judgment of the preceding series. Furthermore, all three series continue to the end of the tribulation with the judgments compounding upon each other, disaster upon disaster of unimaginable magnitude. The seventh trumpet contains all the bowls and the seventh seal all the trumpets. The placement of each series on my chart above is, illustrative pur is for illustrative purpose only and is not an attempt to identify their exact timing within the 70th week, except as noted in the following. Illustration number one takes the position that the seals and trumpets fall within the first half of the tribulation with the seventh trumpet coming at or right after the beginning of the great tribulation. Illustration number two takes the position that all three series fall within the second half of the Great or the Great Tribulation. And illustration number three has the first five seals in the first half of the Tribulation and the sixth and seventh seals falling in the very beginning of the Great Tribulation. Many expositors, including myself, lean to number one. But Dwight Pentecost, in his book, Things to Come, makes a good argument for number three using Matthew 24. Regardless, it seems obvious that the first seal, the rider on the white horse, is at the beginning of the tribulation. It also seems logical that the second and third seals, war and scarcity on earth, which would be associated with war, could also be in the first half of the tribulation. We have wars and rumors of wars, even now on a relatively small scale, and scarcity is coming out of that. Here's the chronological order so far. <clears throat> First half of the week, Israel will experience chastisements, although they will dwell in relative safety under the covenant with the Antichrist that was seen in Daniel 9.27. In the middle of the week, a great persecution will break out when the abomination of desolation goes up in the temple and Levitical sacrifices cease. Believing Israel will then have to flee to the east. We will see much more detail on these events later in our study. <clears throat> With that frame of reference, let's begin our study of the judgment. Revelation 6.1. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown 
was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. A white horse and rider is revealed to John. <clears throat> Some interpret this rider to be Jesus Christ, mainly because of Revelation 19.11, where we do see Christ returning at the second advent on a white horse. But just because there's the white horse in both passages does not necessarily mean that we have the same rider. It was traditional in those days for victorious persons, such as emperors and generals, to ride white horses in parades of triumph after success in war. So the white horse more likely symbolizes victory for the rider rather than identifies the rider. This is our first look at the Antichrist, the ruler who is to come of Daniel 29, 26. We'll see more detail on him later. He carries a bow and wears a crown, but notice no arrows for the bow. The bow is obviously an implement of war and has long range when considered in its historical context. We might think of the bow as equivalent to a modern rifle in our time. But more accurately, it was often used more as short-range artillery in John's time. It is thus thought that the bow, bow implies far-reaching power. The fact that he has no arrows can suggest several things. Either his power is merely threatening, and it really does not have the power he implies he has, or he simply does not have to deploy the power in a violent way. Regardless, he goes out conquering and to conquer. He accumulates power over others that might otherwise require military might. <clears throat> he conquers without killing. He wears a crown, and his crown is a Stephanos, not a diadem. A Stephanos is a crown of the victor, not a ruler. He is a great peacemaker, and according to Daniel 9, he makes a treaty with Israel that apparently guarantees her continued existence and permission for Israel to build the third temple and begin animal sacrifices again. We know there is a third temple and animal sacrifices because they're mentioned in Matthew 24, 15 and Daniel 9, 27. This peace treaty with Israel is considered to be the official beginning of the tribulation. Putting all this together, the rider carries a bow, rides a white horse, wears a victor's crown. He is presumed to be the Antichrist, the prince who will come. He assumes power and conquers others in a bloodless victory and establishes some level of peace, especially for Israel. <clears throat> Second seal, we have conflict. Revelation 6, 3, <clears throat> when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The peace didn't last very long but most expositors agree this probably does not involve Israel, at least for a while. In every dispensation, there are wars and rumors of wars, just as Christ warned in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are but the beginning of birth pains. The words of Christ closely parallel the vision of Daniel 9 and the seven sealed judgments in Revelation. Although Antichrist evidently attempts to exercise control over the world, he has varying degrees of success. These wars and rumors of war are only the beginning and things are going to get worse as Christ warned. The first seal revealed the Antichrist, and the second seal 
we see a dramatic change from peace to warfare. The writer has a sword and makes war. This figure does not so much represent a person as it does a trend, war and killing. Some expositors note that only the horse is mentioned as changing and not the rider, whatever that means. Third seal, we have scarcity on earth, Revelation 6, 5. And then he opened the third seal. I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Scarcity comes with warfare. We experienced food rationing during World War II here in the relative safety of America. Americans did without all manner of things, mainly because the war effort demanded so much of what America could produce. And many of those who would be doing the farming and the producing were in the military. With economies so dependent upon each other today, it will only be worse. We'll see some of that right now because of supply chain disruptions, some of which are related to the war in Ukraine. A denarius was roughly a day's wages when this was written. Then it could buy roughly 10 times what is stated in this passage. Here, it can only buy enough wheat or barley to feed one person for one meal. That means that working man or woman could earn enough to just feed themselves one meal and not their family or pay for other needs such as rent, fuel, etc. This is hyperinflation. The economy will tank and many will suffer as a result. Famine almost always follows war. The oil and the wine, though considered luxury, seem to be available for those who can afford it. That suggests a level of relative luxury for the governing elite. It was noted by some expositors that olive trees and grapevines, unlike other crops, can thrive with very little human tending. The fourth seal, widespread death on earth. Revelation 6, 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him. The power and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So now we have a dramatic picture of divine judgment upon the world. The horse is an unearthly color, pale, should be translated literally pale green, a sickly color. The rider is pictured as death. And in his aftermath, Hades follows. Hades, hell or Sheol, is the abode of the lost dead. We'll look at Hades in more detail later in this study. The rider has the power of death over one-fourth of the Earth's population. It is projected that we'll have a population of 8 billion people come November of this year. One-fourth of that would be 2 billion people dead. If the four, first four seals are during the first half of the tribulation, then it will not be a very pleasant time. <clears throat> The writer is symbolic, and these deaths will come from a number of sources, including famine, warfare, and demon activity. <clears throat> now, about divine restraint. What we have in the first four seals is what some expositors see as a group of four connected events. They do not necessarily represent individuals, although the first does in some respects speak of the coming and revealing of Antichrist. 
they do express the work of divine judgment, which comes from God upon man in two ways, passive and active. <coughs> Excuse me. The passive judgment is that God allowed the sin natures of mankind to impact the world, and he uses that for his own divine purpose. We also call this God's permissive will. Active intervention by God is through his providential powers. God proactively, providentially acts in the lives of individuals and even nations to exert his will upon them. What we see in the first four seals is mostly the passive intervention by God and the removal of divine restraint of sin. God allows mankind to experience the full impact of his negative decisions. No words to reap what he's sown. In first, second Thessalonians 2 1, we've seen this passage before, but let's look at it again. Now, brethren, <clears throat> Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind and troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in our own time. <clears throat> For the ministry of lawlessness is already at work. <clears throat> Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, so that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but shed pleasure in unrighteousness. Our focus is on verse 7, the removal of the restraint. Note the sequence. First, he who restrains is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. We have already developed this in our pre-trib rapture support. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit in the capacity of indwelling all born-again believers during the church age. As a result of the removal of the church in the rapture, plus God returning to dealing with Israel in the last seven years of the age of Israel, that's Daniel's 70th week, we have a return to the conditions found in that age. That means no universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit and his influence on individual believers. That does not imply that the Holy Spirit ceases to work in the hearts of men. We will later see evidence that he does continue ministering during his return to the age of Israel. What this does imply is the restraining work of the Holy Spirit is lifted and man's sin nature is unrestrained. The only restraint remaining then seems to be the divine institution of government, that is, the fear of law. But government is often even now corrupt and will become much more so during the tribulation. It will take only a short while before it becomes evident to the unsaved that the mysterious disappearance of those judgmental church goers. There is little or no restraint on their sin natures, and they can do what they want. We see a perfect example of this in the defund the police movement. In jurisdictions that have adopted this, along with liberal policing style, 
are seeing a dramatic increase in crime. The other writers flow out of this lifting of divine restraint as God allows the Antichrist the freedom to make his case and fail. The first four seals can be classified as man-made disasters. There's an attempted peace which soon disintegrates in the warfare. The war and the effects associated with war, one-fourth of the world's population will die, two billion people. Under the law, God promised Israel peace based on their obedience to the law. When Israel was in obedience to the law, God often used them as instruments of his judgment on others. But when Israel was not in compliance with the terms of the covenant, God used evil nations to discipline Israel. We are not under the law, but we do function under that same basic principle. God does prosper natures that call upon him, that follow him, that have their core values and culture that is based on divine principles. Deviation from that is an invitation for God to turn his back on those who have turned their backs on him. Divine discipline is the result, just like he inflicted on idolatrous Israel. Would we not expect him to treat America the same way? The fifth seal, the cry of the martyrs. <clears throat> when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our, avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. So we have a shift of scene here from what's happening on earth to heaven. <clears throat> this scene takes place during the first half of the tribulation, but could be capturing the idea of the martyr dead in both halves. John looks under the altar and sees the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That Greek word translated slain means killed by violence. These are martyrs that came out of the tribulation. These in verse nine are in heaven and are given white robes, which implies they're saved. This is further supported by the reason given for their death. It was slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Implied in that statement is the fact that believers during the tribulation will find it very difficult to express their faith. To do so is to invite death as a martyr for Christ. The fact that they cry out for God to judge and avenge their blood also implies their tormentors and murderers are still alive and still dwelling on earth. The answer to their cry for judgment is in verse 11. The martyrs are told they must wait. Wait a while for the judgment of their tormentors, and they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. This implies their number is not yet complete, and there will be other martyrs to come out of the tribulation to join their number under the altar. 2 <clears throat> Timothy 3.12 reminds us, indeed, all of us who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In the English, the term under the altar suggests that we're physically gathered under an altar in heaven. But I think this should be viewed more figuratively and in the context of the law. Remember, this period is a return to the age of Israel and all that's associated with it. Under the concept of Levitical offerings, the blood of the offerings was sprinkled on the altar and its side. This was a foreshadowing 
of the shedding of blood, shedding of the blood of Christ. I believe this is picturing Old Testament saints using the figurative language under the altar as the pre-cross type for the cross. In an age of Israel context, this is a picture of believers who have come under the saving influence pictured by the blood sprinkled on the altar when Israel was under the law. They are not physically cowering under the altar in heaven but they are saved and in heaven because of their faith in the blood of Christ symbolized by the altar and the blood sacrifices. A question arises concerning these tribulational martyrs regarding their bodies. They're seen as wearing white robes. This implies robes are hanging on something that has physical form. The problem is these people have not yet received their resurrection bodies. That will not happen until the end of the tribulation and it's pictured in Revelation 20. Revelation 20 verse four, and I saw thrones and they that sat on them, judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Tribulation martyred believers do not get a formal resurrection until the end of the tribulation when all Old Testament saints are resurrected. Then if they do not have their resurrection bodies yet, as seen here in Revelation 6, what form do they have? Some argue they're spirit beings, but spirit beings don't wear robes. Scholars are divided on whether or not these in heaven before they are resurrected have some form of temporary body or not. I believe 2 Corinthians 5 possibly refers to such an interim body. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. To be fair, most expositors, however, see this as referring to the final resurrection body, but a few don't. One points out that this resurrection body is said to be earthly in that it is corruption putting on incorruption, suggesting a change of its nature, whereas the fleshly body in verse 1 is said to be a tent that is temporary in exchange for a building that is made in heaven. In verse 2, Paul is longing to be clothed in this dwelling from heaven. And in verse 3, he says, this is so he will not be found naked. This suggests that the dwelling made in heaven may not be the resurrection body at all, but another body of a temporary nature that awaits the resurrection body. Note that at the time Paul wrote this, the church had not yet been resurrected, rapture. And those who died before the rapture are seen as being resurrected at that time. They must have had some sort of temporary body until they were resurrected. At the time depicted here by John, the Old Testament saints have not yet received their resurrection bodies. <clears throat> A human soul evidently requires some form of housing. In the absence of an earthly body and the resurrection body not yet granted, an interim resurrection body is in order, so the soul will not, as Paul says, be found naked. <coughs> Excuse me. 
In 2 Peter 1.14, we see Peter talking about laying aside his earthly dwelling, implying that it is put aside for future use when it will be changed to an incorruptible body. And there are a number of expositors that believe we will receive a temporary resurrection body until our actual resurrection takes place. At that point, our corruptible human bodies, in some cases long rotted in the earth or even destroyed by fire or explosion as in war, are resurrected and changed into incorruptible bodies for our eternal existence. Remember, Jesus did not abandon his earthly tent to decay in the grave and take on a whole new resurrection body. Rather, his earthly body was transformed into his resurrection body. Though this is far from conclusive, the evidence suggests these saints under the altar or in some form of temporary resurrection body awaiting the resurrection at the end of the tribulation. <clears throat> Uh, the voice is fading. <clears throat> Sixth seal, we have cosmic disturbances. Revelation 6, 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, <clears throat> and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. <clears throat> and the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand it's difficult to paint a more horrific scene than this one some have a tendency to interpret this as, as symbolic while others urge us to see these as literal events one point we should be sure of is this is the picture of God acting providentially. This isn't man being the instrument of God's judgment. This is God's wrath directly and emphatically intervening in human affairs. <clears throat> These judgments originate, originate with God as divine punishment upon a blasphemous world. The judgment seen here are common in prophecies pertaining to the end of the age. Christ himself predicted earthquakes in Matthew 24, 7. Earthquakes and the sun being blocked out and the moon red is also predicted in Joel, in Joel 3, 2, 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The sky opens up and rolls back like a scroll. I can't even imagine what that looks like. It must be a very intimidating sight and clearly of divine nature. There are mighty earthquakes around the globe and that affects all locations. Although not mentioned here, this probably creates volcanoes. The ash and dust from the earthquakes and the volcanoes or in the atmosphere and cause the sun to dim as seen through sackcloth. Sackcloth has a very coarse weave that light only partially penetrates. At night, the moon has the blood red color. The stars fall from the sky. And the word for stars refers to celestial bodies. This can be literal stars or probably meteors that impact the earth and even contribute to the junk in the atmosphere. All of this causes those on earth to panic. Revelation 6, 5, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, 
Every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and said to the mountains and the rocks, follow us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? It becomes obvious that this is divine judgment. <clears throat> These people are frightened. But note their reaction. They don't repent and seek God. They hide in caves and ask for death to spare them of this suffering. But what about the suffering of eternity? This is biblical proof that when some see the truth in its most vivid form and even recognize its source, they still will not turn to God. It be, should be noted that the day of wrath is not a literal day. A biblical day can be a time period shorter than a literal day or even much longer, which is the case here. Chapter 6 closes. Having advanced the narrative to a high point in the progress of the book, but we still have the seventh seal, not to mention the trumpets and the bold judgment. The chapter closes with a comment by those hiding from God's wrath, who still is be able to stand? Indeed, who shall be able to stand against God? The obvious answer is only those who don't run away from God, but run to him and avail themselves of his grace. Even though they suffer a martyr's death, this is exactly what we'll see in the next chapter. And since I'm running out of voice, that's a good place to stop. Um, I'll open up the floor to questions and comments. <clears throat> hey, Lane, I have a question. On page 11, it says tribulation martyred believers do not get a formal resurrection till the end of the tribulation when all Old Testament saints get resurrected. Aren't the Old Testament resurrected saints raptured? No. no. The rapture included only the church. Because I think it says the believers. <clears throat> so those in Christ and that term in Christ is only used in connection with the church. Okay. <clears throat> So would Abraham be in that group? Abraham will be resurrected at the end of the church, uh, at the end of the church, at the end of the tribulation. <coughs> the uh, resurrection at the end of the tribulation will include only church, I'm sorry, will include only Old Testament believers, which will include those from the tribulation. <clears throat> I'm sorry, say that again? The resurrection at the end of the tribulation, at the second advent, will include all Old Testament saints, including those in the tribulation. Hmm. So there's, there's really three resurrections. There's, well, there's four count Christ. He's the first resurrection. Second resurrection is all church age believers at the rapture. And they're identified by that phrase, in Christ, the dead in Christ, and then we who are alive. <clears throat> and then there's the resurrection of all Old Testament saints at the end of the tribulation. And then at the end of the millennium will be the resurrection of the lost. That's it. That chart there that Annette has up, um, there are people all over the place on this, as you can see from <clears throat> the examples. And, um, but I lean towards number one on the list there. <clears throat> Um, 
And I think we'll see that as we continue on in this study. So, Elaine, wouldn't you agree that the white horse and the first seal is the coming of the Antichrist, and he comes without Erebus? So, though he comes with power, he doesn't come in war particularly. He comes by peace treaties and talking uh, smoothly or whatever you want to put. The whole key here is what does the treaty between Israel and the Antichrist look like to start the tribulation? And I think I keep thinking it's a physical treaty, peace treaty that arises, but I'm not sure it'll be that obvious. That's my only concern. Now, will I be here or not? Uh, that's a question of whether it's pre-rapture or pre-trib, post-trib or mid-trib, and I'm not going there with any of that, but the question is, is the first horse, I think, is the Antichrist. He's coming without war initially. He's coming with peace treaties. That's where Israel gets the, the first peace treaty. But I don't really know what that looks like. It might be so subtle in the background, we don't ever see it. That's what scares me. I've given a lot of thought to this. And... The scripture is not real clear on it. <clears throat> um, a couple of things come to mind to me, and I can't get my head around it completely. One is <clears throat> there appears to be no mention of America in the end times. That we don't exist. And there could be many reasons for that. <clears throat> I mean, we'll look at the conditions in the country today and the conflict and strife, which is mostly verbal right now, could become physical. And then we add to that the rapture of the church, which um, there are not as many believers in this country as a lot of people think. Not everybody sitting in the church is going to be raptured. <laughs> and Regardless, the removal, sudden and mysterious removal of millions of people is going to have a traumatic effect on this country. And I think it's going to throw America into chaos. <clears throat> and I think that Israel is going to quickly realize we have just lost our chief benefactor. They're in the middle of a civil war or something over there on the other side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> And we can't get the support, the protection we've had before. And that, I think, is one of the motivating factors that turns them to another source um, of protection. And the Antichrist uh, offers that kind of security to Israel. And one of the things that, that comes out later is that the Antichrist is apparently perceived by them as being Messiah. That opens up a whole bunch of other questions, but <clears throat> regardless, they do accept his offer of some form of protection. And it's clear that they're protected because they seem to be not be involved in a lot of the stuff that's going on in the early part of the tribulation. <clears throat> and they don't really get sucked into it until the midpoint. If one of the things besides protection or some sense of security offered by the Antichrist, evidently <clears throat> he somehow makes it possible for them to complete the uh, third temple and begin animal sacrifices. We know it's third temple exists during the tribulation and there is animal sacrifices because they're mentioned at the midpoint of the tribulation. So it has to have been built and started sometime before that. I can't even begin to speculate how the Muslim world is going to accept that because it's going to require some alterations to Temple Mount, which it doesn't take much to get them really animated over what's going on up there. <clears throat> but apparently this guy is cool and I don't know, he comes up with some plan or something, um, or maybe his threat of force. 
that um, allows Israel to not only enjoy at some level of peace, but also to uh, rebuild the temple and resume animal sacrifices. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the temple, I am told, I, I, I can't vouch for the source. I'm told that they've already prepared um, building materials for the temple. And I am told, which I tend to doubt this, but who knows, that they could throw a temple up pretty quick. <clears throat> we think months or even a year or more, um, this source suggests they could do it in days. I, I can't fathom that, but anyway. <clears throat> One thing we do know, and this is certain, is that they're planning on building a temple. The question is, when are they going to build it? They do, they have researched the lineage of people who are qualified to be temple priests, uh, Levites. They have researched, designed, and they have produced the articles of worship that will be needed in the temple. And that includes the various vessels that are used in the worship services. Um, and it includes the, the garments, the vestments that the temple priests will wear to conduct their services. So they fully intend to build this temple and they are prepared to do that now. Uh, whether or not they can actually pull it off right now is another question, but I think we're very close to that. So clearly there's a temple and somehow, and I cannot in my mind, fathom exactly how this, the Antichrist pulls this off, but he apparently makes it possible for them to do this in some level of safety uh, uh, and security uh, that they won't be attacked um, when they start building this temple on Temple Mount. Hmm. Strange times, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, anybody else? <clears throat> well, obviously, we have a lot more to cover in this very interesting subject. I got three little comments, Wayne. Just two-bit comments, just my opinion. First, on the rapture, I don't think there's enough Christians left in the world that's going to be even that. I don't think there'd be any chaos about it. They'll write us off as they went out in the woods. That's just crazy people anyway. I think that we'll just be dismissed. There won't be enough of us to matter. Number two, the temple, and this is just my own opinion, I'm just throwing it out since it's a discussion. Um, the temple mount, I think the temple was in the city of David, not on the temple mount. I think that was a garrison of Roman, like a little city for the Romans. This is my opinion, things I've read and studied. And third, they're waiting on that red heifer. I've read pretty much a lot of stuff about the red heifer. They need to purify all the priest stuff and get the temple going. When that red heifer shows up, to me, that's a mile marker for the Lord. He's saying, okay, get ready. Just oh, my six bits of information. On, on the location of the temple in the city of David versus the temple mount, yeah. Uh, yes, I've read that, and there are there are a number of scholars who believe that the temple was there. Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think it was on Temple Mount, but you know, we'll find out. Yeah. As far as the red heifer goes, and it's got to be fifteen years ago. I saw a uh, a thing on TV. Uh, man, maybe it's on the internet of um it was an interview with a farmer from or cattle rancher from um alabama and he was working with um the temple mount faithful to breed a perfect red heifer 
And at that time, they'd been unsuccessful, but they were close. Uh, the qualifications for a red heifer is it must not have any color hair on it other than red. And the so far, the ones that they had been breathing, breeding that were coming close, they had a few white hairs on the chest, on the breast. So they've been working on that for at least 10 years. Mm-hmm. And you're right, Charlie, once, once that's done, then they're going to want to move ahead. <clears throat> now, what was the first question? Oh, the rapture. Oh, about the rapture. Uh, well, the question, like I said, it was just my big comment. But, you know, I, I just don't think there's going to be enough of us to matter. Well, I think you're right. I think there are far fewer going to disappear than, than people might think that uh, there's a whole lot of people sitting in churches that have not put their faith and trust in Christ. They're mm-hmm. working for their salvation. Yeah. <clears throat> but, and I think you're right, they're going to write this off. And there's a number of explanations I've seen for that. <clears throat> One of them is the, uh, the uh, aliens have come down that we've been hearing all these alien stuff lately. <clears throat> they're going to come down and they're going to take the evil people away. And the evil people are going to be these uh, church people. Well, how are they going to explain all the children that disappear? They're not the evil ones. <sighs> that can explain anything these days. <laughs> it doesn't have yeah, to make sure. sense. True. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's going to be an attempt to write it off. And I mean, I mean, look at some of the stuff we're seeing going on in government today. <laughs> If people ought to be being prosecuted for this and it's just ignored or written off. Oh, well, it was nothing. Don't worry about it. Uh, move along. Nothing to see here. <clears throat> but what I do think is going to happen is enough of these people that are raptured are going to have, uh, are, are going to be significant movers and shakers in industry and in government and in society that it's going to affect society whether they're written off as uh, meaningless or not, and it's going to impact society. And I think that kind of stuff can create, can contribute to the chaos. And imagine the people that don't understand what's happened. They're going to be going berserk over this. And I'm talking about the, the individuals on, I don't, uh, you know, and your neighbors and whatnot who are not believers. <clears throat> That's going to create chaos. So this, I mean, even if the number of Christians who are removed in a rapture are relatively small, um, it's still going to have a tremendous impact on society. And this country today is kind of teetering on the edge. There's people talking about a norm revolution. And they're serious. And there's the... The verbal and mental conflict between the two Republicans and the Democrats is increasing. And I don't know, who knows where that's gonna wind up. I, I think the United States definitely is not included, not mentioned in any way that I can find in scripture during this period. So the United States must be a non-entity during this period. They're, they're in chaos. <clears throat> All right. All right, my voice, I think, is just about gone. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, hey, I'm- hey, Lane, this is Tess. One of the things that, um, as you were talking, you and Charlie, you, you know, and I don't know, <laughs> I know one of the one of the challenges I have, you know, in with society right now is, it, it, um, we've our American society, and I think even global society, has become so addicted to technology that they're living in a fake life and cannot and do not have the courage to live in reality. You know, they're diverting themselves and placating themselves with false narratives. And they're, they, so when, when this happens, a couple of things, as you were talking, I realized it's like the warning signs of what is happening and what is going to occur and how it's going to occur. Number one, they have no knowledge. And number two, even though there's going to be global catastrophic events, they're going to, I think we've got into such a pattern of putting 
false um, wrappings around things that they're, they're just going to justify it away. They're just going to, they're never going to circle around to recognize what the reality is that's facing them. <laughs> and I think that they're, I, you know, I don't know if there's going to be, you know, is, is the chaos going to be magnified chaos? I think it's going to be magnified um, paralysis, amnesia, you know, even mental, you know, uh, and cognitive dissonance where they're just, they're, they're so involved in a fake world and that they, they cannot be brought back to what is happening in front of them. I don't, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I just, I, I, it's not even politics for me. I feel that our human system has become so detached from reality and the technology is only pushing us further in that direction. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> and look at uh, those in Revelation 6, 17. Uh, the ones that were hiding in the caves is a perfect example of that. They, yes. they couldn't face reality. <clears throat> and even in the face of, um, of the truth and understanding the truth, they couldn't deal with it. Yes. yes. Well, and I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Have you ever heard of Dr. Henry Cloud? Name sounds familiar, but no. I have, Tess. Yeah, he, yeah. he, yeah, so he, um, I've read quite a few of his, his books. And so he has a book called Integrity, which is the courage to face the ch reality, you know? And so it's not just, you know, our quick, you know, corporate or personal mission statement where we're kind of putting out into the world this fake, you know, this fake picture of us. We're actually able to, live life with integrity where we're facing the reality of what it is to not just be human, but also to be Christian. And so he's very faith-based um, and, and he's a psychologist by trade, but he also does a lot of stuff with organizations and leaders. And that's how I was introduced to him. Um, but I, I love that uh, description of integrity. It is the courage to face reality. And we do not have a lot of courageous um, courageous humans. And I think sometimes even um, those who profess to be faith based or faithful, um, they're taking the, the easy way. And I, we've had many conversations about this, you know, they are going to church on Sunday to hear the music, to feel good, but that is not really facing the reality of, of what this means. Hey, Tess, uh, just a comment. I totally agree with your, your statements. I think, that, I think the changing thing, if there is, is when the, when the true church is raptured, that's when people, I think, will have a reality check. It's not until, in my opinion, the rapture, they will self-justify away everything that happens and never even look at it until that rapture occurs. And I think that is going to be the thing that if there's, if there's anything that will ever get anybody to turn. Now, with that said, we know a lot of people, even in the second half of the tribulation, still curse God and, and they don't come to God when they see all the wrath. So even with the rapture and the wrath, people still will not accept God. That I think is true. But I think, what you're talking about, we won't see reality, I think, until the rapture occurs and we'll be, we'll be gone. So, so a real quick question, Lane. So for the, for the rapture, you know, so I automatically think of Christ and I automatically think of what would be the one thing that would actually wake people up, you know, and it would be for them to see him. It would be what, Tess? It would be for people to actually see him for his return. <clears throat> so will they physically see him? See who? Or will this be a spiritual? You, There'd be a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they'll hear the noise even, Barry. Because <clears throat> um, the the noise, the trumpet, and the call are directed towards those that are being raptured. So I'm not sure anybody else is going to hear it. 
Uh, yeah. Um, Yeah. So to so if they haven't if so if they haven't turned to him, then it's too late. Right. Yeah. It's too late to go up in the rapture. Yeah. Not too late to believe. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of new believers right after the rapture. Mm Mm-hmm. I think they're going to realize, gee, my sister or my husband or my friend or whatever, been talking about this. And yeah, I think he was right. Maybe I better look into it. Also, there's going to be many, many false pastors and false religions saying the rapture couldn't happen because we're still here. Right. <laughs> yeah. You have a yeah. lot of contra yeah. you know, opinion or whatever. Oh, that's it's going to be that's the phrase people are going to try and, and turn it into something else yeah. <clears throat> because they weren't involved. <clears throat> turn it into something evil. I think they call that fake news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. drowning in it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lane. It's a joy to be back with everybody. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be back. And I'm, I'm trying to get ahead in my study. Um, I'm going to be traveling in another couple of weeks to Florida, so I got to get enough lessons fully prepared and ready to go. And I'm in looking ahead, uh, like I, I mentioned earlier before we started, I'm seeing things I did not see the first two trips I made through this, <clears throat> or maybe three trips I made through it. And that's the most amazing thing about God's Word is every time you look at it, even though you've looked at it before, He'll show you something new. You have to keep your mind and your heart open to the truth. And you have to remain dependent upon God to show you these things. So with that, let's close with prayer. Father, for your precious word and all of the marvelous things that you've left there for us to discover, we ask that your spirit guide us through this week that we might be witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.